Hello, I am Catherine Jones Harrison, a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. My father was a full-blood Molala. I'm a past council member, having served my people for 22 years. As the five Western Oregon tribes come together to recognize and celebrate Oregon's sesquicentennial anniversary, we take pride in being the first inhabitants of the land we now know as Oregon. From beautiful, breathtaking mountains, clean, clear-flowing rivers, valleys, and shorelines, this area has been the homeland of our native people since time immemorial. In the beginning, we were the only ones, each in our own homeland. This past 150 years is a very short time in native history. It was a time filled with first contact, the treaty era, the sad, disastrous termination, and our joyful restoration. You will hear each tribe's story over the last 150 years. Times filled with joy and good fortune, thanks to the Creator who showered us with many blessings, but also extreme hardship and injustice. This is our story. The Native people have been in Oregon from time immemorial. Oregon, a special place. Our native people have enjoyed the beauty and bounty of this land, have endured hardships, but still survive today. We are a part of the land, a part of her fabric, a part of her past, and a part of her future. Oregon marks 150 years of statehood, and Oregon's native people join in the celebration. Forty years before Columbus set sail on his historic voyage, Pope Nicholas V issued a document declaring war against all non-Christians throughout the world, and specifically sanctioning the conquest and colonization of non-Christian nations and their territories. Thus, early explorers set sail with the express understanding that they were authorized to take possession of any lands they discovered. Despite the fact that native people already possessed the land and had thriving communities for thousands of years before their so-called discovery. European explorers began interacting with native people over 500 years ago. 
and in 1537, Pope Paul III proclaimed Indians to be human with rights to own property. Following colonization of the New World and the Revolutionary War, the United States of America was formed. The U.S. acquired territories to the West and the idea that the United States should span from the Atlantic to the Pacific was promoted. In fact, the belief was held that it was the country's manifest destiny to stretch from coast to coast. In 1787, the Northwest Ordinance was adopted by the Continental Congress that formed the Northwest Territory. The ordinance stated, The utmost good faith shall always be observed toward the Indians. Their land and property shall never be taken without their consent. And in their property rights and liberty, they shall never be invaded or disturbed. Soon after, a new government was formed, the United States of America. The Founding Fathers created a constitution to rule the land. This constitution recognized the tribes as sovereign nations. As history has shown, this intention was not followed. Lewis and Clark were the first overland American explorers to come to the Pacific Northwest. Along their journey, they found and documented a rich, thriving Native American culture. The Native people interacted frequently with the expedition, trading goods, services, and providing assistance. During the winter of 1805 to 1806, the expedition built an encampment near the Columbia River, not far from present-day Astoria. They named it Fort Clatsop, after the local Clatsop tribe of Indians. Explorers discovered the bounties of the Pacific Northwest and settlers began arriving in the region. The native people shared the land and bounty with the newcomers, as well as methods of fishing, gathering, and hunting within their homeland. The Donation Land Claims Act of 1850 encouraged more newcomers to arrive that set the stage for increased tensions with the native people. Treaties were signed between the U.S. government and Indian tribes. The Constitution guarantees that treaties become the law of the land. Oregon was granted statehood in 1859. Many native people were relocated to reservations while others went into seclusion. In 1954, the Western Oregon Termination Act was passed by Congress. While it was advertised to set the Indians free, it actually caused federal recognition of tribes to cease to exist. Over 60 Western Oregon tribes were affected by the termination era. Today, there are nine federally recognized tribes in Oregon. Five tribes live west of the Cascades. This is our story, our history of survival and a vision for our future. It is an intricate fabric that contains many common threads. A fabric of history, spirit, survival, determination, cooperation, and vision. November 17, 1977, the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians were the first tribe in Oregon to regain federal recognition. For the Siletz people, it was not an easy journey, but it was a necessary journey, and a journey that paved the way for the restoration efforts of the other Oregon tribes. The Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians is a confederation of many tribes and bands of what is now Western Oregon, whose ancestors agreed to remove to and confederate under the stipulations of eight treaties with the U.S. government on the Siletz Reservation.
The Solette's reservation was established in 1855 on 1.1 million acres on the central Oregon coast. By 1875, over 900,000 acres of the Solette's reservation were taken without agreement or compensation, leaving only 225,000 acres. After the people relocated to the 1.1 million coast reservations, many of the articles in the treaty were um, denied and largely ignored. And with, within 20 years, 900,000 acres of our original reservation were removed, mostly by illegal means. They, uh, they did that action without ever having any tribal officials anyone from tribal government, you know, sitting with them in Washington, D.C. When they, when they took that action. Not one Solette's official was there. Not one Solette's member was there. In 1892, each tribal member present was assigned a small parcel, and the rest of the reservation was declared surplus and open to settlement by non-Indians. During the period of time that the tribe uh, was removed to the, to the reservation, um, we suffered great losses in, in numbers. Um, losses because of starvation, because of illnesses and diseases that weren't common to Indian people, like smallpox. Then in 1954, Congress passed the Oregon Termination Act ending U.S. relations with the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians and disposing of the remaining reservation. Uh, the Siletz people, which represents all of Western Oregon Indians, have kept most of their traditions intact and alive through all of the uh, awful federal policies of first extermination, uh, removal to the reservation, allotments, um, termination, and finally restoration again. The effort to restore the tribe as a sovereign nation began in the early 1970s. The restoration of our tribe um, was a major um, political move. It took a lot of lobbying and a lot of hard work during some pretty tough years without any funds but it paved the way for the rest of the Oregon tribes, the Western Oregon tribes, to be restored. We had no lands. We had access to a few acres where our, where our tribal cemetery was, but it was owned by the city of Salette. It was not owned by our, by our people. So we had no lands to take back to Congress and say, say that, uh, you know, we needed their help. On November 18, 1977, the Siletz became the second tribe in the nation and the first in Oregon to regain federal recognition as an Indian tribe after having been terminated by Congress. With the enactment of the Siletz Reservation Act in 1980, the Siletz tribes regained 3,600 acres of their former 1.1 million acre reservation. Keeping our language alive is vitally important to us. Um, the terms that we use to describe things uh, in our traditions and in our ceremonial uh, activities can't really be described in the English language the way that they can in the Athabascan language. Um, it really has to do with a way that people look at the world and uh, that way that our people uh, of Western Oregon have looked at the world for thousands of years is embodied in those languages. So it's vitally important uh, that we keep those alive. Way back when our ancestors lived on this great land of Western Oregon, the Creator created a supermarket for our people to live. Everything was here. Everything was in place. The seasons come and went, the rains, the sunshine, the warm, the cold provided, the thunder and the lightning provided. To take care of what is provided for you, it will take care of you. 
The Celeste Tribe is committed to helping its members thrive in a modern world while supporting and maintaining their incredibly rich history and cultural heritage. That is really an important aspect of whether you're teaching language, whether you're teaching dance or basketry, is the, uh, that pan-generational um, getting together of our families uh, from elders down to young people. That's how we learn, that's how we share our traditions, and that's how we keep them alive. When young people see uh, their elders, their parents, their grandparents doing things, it says to them, this is the way it should be, and this is the way that we want to keep our traditions alive, and it's okay for us to do these things, that it's right. So we try to involve families in every way we can and, uh, and do those things the right way. Chinook Winds Casino Resort is the tribe's most ambitious business adventure yet. Opening in 1995, the business has enabled the tribe to become more self-sufficient and provide more needed services to its members. The casino, Lincoln County's largest employer, has proven beneficial to the entire surrounding community and region. It stands as a symbol of their goodwill and determination to build better lives for present and future generations and to create a more prosperous, healthy, and happy community for us all. The Cal Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians were ignored by the U.S. government until they were terminated in 1954, despite having been one of the first tribes in Oregon to execute a treaty with the U.S. government in 1853. It was a long and difficult process, but the Cow Creeks were restored on December 29, 1982. The Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians live between the Cascade and Coast Ranges in southwestern Oregon within the Umpqua and Rogue River watersheds, primarily along the South Umpqua and its main tributary, Cow Creek, for thousands of years. Their homeland was beautiful and resources were abundant. Big Rocks is located uh, on the winter camp of our people. It was a source of food, not only for fish, but there was the freshwater uh, mussel beds there and uh, mink. The Cow Creeks made extensive use of huckleberry patches along the Rogue Umpqua Divide. Deer and elk were abundant, as were summer runs of silver salmon and winter runs of steelhead. During the salmon runs, the Cow Creeks built weirs across the streams and placed basket traps made of hazel shoots in narrow channels. The salmon in great numbers would pass up by the side of the trap and failing to get above the dam would be carried back into the open end of the trap and the weight of the water would hold them. When gold was discovered in the 1850s, survival became difficult. Hydraulic mining filled rivers with dirt and debris and damaged salmon runs. Miners brought disease and epidemics swept through the villages, killing tribal members including their chief, Maiwalita. When efforts were made to remove the Cow Creeks to reservations to the north, many resisted. In response, exterminators were sent to kill the Cow Creek people. When the tribes had to go in hiding, they knew from the uh, folks who were called the exterminators that came in with the uh, particular uh, reason, or purpose, of killing our people. It's documented in history how the tribes would flee uh, to the mountains. But yet again, they would come back and winter as much as they could in their own campsites. The Cow Creeks went into seclusion while maintaining their way of life. Eventually, many Cow Creek people married pioneers, miners, and fur traders in the area and their descendants still live in the area today. The Cow Creek Tribe is one of the first two tribes in Oregon to secure a treaty with the United States of America. This treaty, signed on September 19, 1853, established 
the government-to-government -government relationships between the two nations. As a result of the treaty, the Cow Creeks became a landless tribe, ceding 800 square miles of southwestern Oregon to the United States. The tribe was to be paid 2.3 cents per acre for their land. The U.S. government was selling the same land through the Donation Land Claims Act for $1.25 an acre to pioneer settlers. The treaty made many additional promises to the Cow Creek people, but was ignored by the U.S. government for nearly a century. In the 1930s, the Cow Creeks attempted redress five times to no avail. One bill that was introduced passed both the U.S. House and Senate, but was vetoed by President Hoover because of the Great Depression. It wasn't until the Western Oregon Indian Termination Act of 1954 that the Cow Creeks were recognized by the federal government, but only for the purpose of termination. This act caused federal recognition of the tribes in Western Oregon to cease to exist. Those first families uh, were uh, so glad to be a part of our so-called recognition by furnishing uh, statements and stories and so on that took us uh, back to that first uh, meeting uh, with the tribe and, and the families. Even without federal recognition, the tribe maintained their identity within the community. In 1980, the Cow Creeks litigated in the U.S. Court of Claims and negotiated a settlement. The Cow Creeks invested their entire judgment in an endowment fund from which they draw, on an annual basis, only the interest earned. These earnings are earmarked for economic development, education, and housing. On December 29, 1982, legislation passed both houses of Congress by unanimous consent that re-establish recognition for the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians. I believe we were able together, all, all of us together, to put our history and background together, and we found humanitarian people that believed in us, believed in our story. This Recognition Act confirmed what tribal members already knew for 129 years, that they were a sovereign tribal government as provided by the Northwest Ordinance and the U.S. Constitution. Today, the tribe continues a long-standing commitment to their members and the community. Cow Creek likes to say that we're really not in the business of doing anything except building people. And that commitment is to our outer community as well as our tribal. As a result of the tribe's economic development investments, they employ over a thousand people. They own and operate the Seven Feathers Casino Resort, Seven Feathers Truck and Travel Center, several RV parks and motels, a beef jerky business, an advertising and media production company, a ranch, and a telecommunications company. The Cow Creeks have a long history of giving to the community. They generously shared the wealth of their land with the early pioneers and taught them native ways of hunting, gathering, fishing, and medicinal remedies. Skills and survival skills and hunting and fishing and using the land resources are what the tribes, and that goes for all the tribes, were able to teach the newcomers to our land. Today, the Cow Creek Tribe continues its generosity of giving back to the community. The tribe donates to numerous nonprofit organizations, schools, and local governments. In addition, the Cow Creek Umpqua Indian Foundation awards grants semi-annually that help support education, positive youth development, and strengthening youth and families. The Cow Creek Tribe maintains a vision for the future a vision to continue strong and positive relationships with their neighbors, a vision that looks forward to the seventh generation, a vision committed to making investments that benefit both tribal members and the communities where they live. The Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde were restored on November 22, 1983. 
But the effort started 11 years earlier when a small group of tribal members started meetings on the last remaining land base of the tribe, the 2.5 acre tribal cemetery. The Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon originated from all across Western Oregon, Southwest Washington, and Northern California. 27 tribes signed treaties that ceded lands to the federal government and were relocated to a section of the Coast Reservation that later became the Grand Ronde Reservation. During the first treaty negotiations in Oregon, the United States wanted to move the tribes east of the Cascade Mountains. The Kalapuyas refused to move, and Chief Alkama expressed the meaning of their land to the commissioners. We understand fully what you mean and that it may be better for us, but our minds are made up. Placing his finger on the place on the map that designated the fork in the Santiam River, he said, We wish to reserve this piece of land. We do not wish to leave this. We would rather be shot on it than be removed. We were a major contributor uh, in the pre-European contract. Contact. We were great um, tradesmen. We had great artistic ability. We had uh, a lot of commodities that other tribes desired. We traded effectively. Of the treaties negotiated in 1851, none were ratified by Congress. In 1853, Superintendent Joel Palmer was sent to renegotiate all of the treaties in Western Oregon. Palmer negotiated eight treaties with the tribes, seven of which were ratified by Congress. Afterward, the Rogue River and Chasta tribes were temporarily relocated to the Table Rock Reservation near Medford, Oregon. In 1856, after the final Rogue River Indian War, the tribes and bands from Table Rock Reservation were marched to the Grand Rod Agency and during the march, eight people died and eight children were born. In 1857, after the Grand Ronde Reservation was created by presidential executive order, most of the Kalapuya, Umpqua, Rogue River, Molala, and Chasta tribes and bands were removed from their homelands and settled along the Yamhill River on the reservation. In 1953, Congress made termination of the tribes a national policy and called termination a way to free Indians from an oppressive federal administration so that they may manage their own affairs. And termination for me meant that, as I understood it, that we were no longer the visible ones. We were invisible. I wasn't going to be deter uh, terminated. I was a, a, a person and a group of people, which is a tribe of people. So how can they take your identity away from you just by terminating you? But uh, it was hard uh, to be out there in the world trying to get a job and, uh, and locate where uh, we didn't make fun of your kids in school. Termination cut this tribe deep. It was, you know, a matter of non-existence, you know. It was, uh, it, it was nothing short of a genocide in my eyes. In 1954, 60 tribes in Western Oregon from two reservations and other rural groups were terminated under the Western Oregon Indians Termination Act. Oregon had the most tribes terminated in any region of the United States. All federal services ended in 1956, and members received $35 for their share of the community land sales. During the post-termination era, Grand Ronde people moved away from the reservation, seeking ways to make a living without federal support. Many families collapsed into poverty, and the tribal community declined, as termination proved to be a failure. In 1972, a small group of Grand Ronde tribal members started working to restore the Grand Ronde tribe many using their own money to finance the effort. Out of the original 69,000 acre reservation, the tribe was left with a land base of 2.5 acres containing the tribal cemetery. This small cemetery became the base of operations for the tribe's restoration efforts. 
On November 22, 1983, the tribe was restored when President Ronald Reagan signed the Grand Ronde Tribes Restoration Act. And in 1988, President Reagan signed the Grand Ronde Reservation Act, returning almost 10,000 acres of the original reservation back to the tribe. From there, the tribe worked to secure a financial base on which it could restore services to its membership and revitalize the tribe's distinct ways and customs. The work of building a tribal nation began. In October 1995, the tribe opened Spirit Mountain Casino, which began funding the tribal government and restoring much-needed social, cultural, and educational services. Restoring the native tradition of potlatch, of giving back to the community, the tribe created Spirit Mountain Community Fund, which distributes 6% of the casino's profits to worthy charitable organizations and causes in 11 western counties. To date, the fund has given more than $45 million in charitable donations, making it one of the largest donors in Oregon. Culturally, the tribe hosts two major powwows and a rodeo annually. It continues to be a good steward of its natural resources, ensuring tribal wildlife habitat is healthy and sustainable. The tribe participates in the Northwest Canoe Journeys and a traditional plank house is being built near Fort Yamhill State Park. While planning is underway on building a tribal cultural center and museum to proudly exhibit the tribal history and traditions. Our destiny is in our hands. We no longer want to be in the position where someone else has the key to whether, our, whether we survive or not. That's, that's of the past. 25 years after restoration, the Grand Ronde tribe is economically, culturally, and socially strong, a tight-knit community of tribal families. As well, the Grand Ronde tribe continues to maintain government-to-government -government relationships with neighboring tribes, the state, and the federal government. The dream of becoming an educated Indian and giving back to my community and my tribe, restoration has afforded um, that for me. And, um, you know, restoration has afforded that for us. And, and not only us and the generation that we're in, but our children and our children's children. And that means that their children and so on and so on and so on. I believe that if we keep our hearts clear and we learn to accept one another that we're, we're gonna be okay. The Grand Ronde Tribe is a vibrant, culturally rich, and economically sound Native community looking to grow stronger in the 21st century while continuing to care for its growing membership, employees, and surrounding communities. The Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians never gave up. They began work in 1916 to lobby for compensation for land that was taken from them. Despite failed attempts, they continued to fight through the 1930s and 40s. After termination in the mid-1950s, their focus shifted to regaining recognition. On October 17, 1984, President Ronald Reagan restored the tribe. Since the beginning of time, the confederated tribe of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians have called the forested land from the Pacific Ocean to the Coast Range Mountains their home. The 70 miles of Ocean Beach from Cut Creek in Coos County to 10 Mile Creek in Lane County and 50 miles inland to the Coast Range provided ample territory for their ancestors to live comfortably for countless generations. The Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla tribes had an Aboriginal territory of about 1,600,000 acres. Permanent winter villages were concentrated along the Lower Coos, Umpqua, and Sayusla rivers, tributaries, and ocean beaches. Seasonal camps existed far upriver as the people followed the migration of salmon and lamprey eels to the Coast Range Mountains. It was right above the ocean and it was a spot that they could go fishing in the ocean, go crabbing, clamming, and then go up on the hillside and, and be on a safe spot for the winter. In the mid-16th century, Spaniards began sailing along the Pacific coast. The British soon followed. 
the foreigners brought many diseases, most notably smallpox. The native people's medicines and immune systems were unprepared. Many died. Fur trappers began arriving in the 1800s. In 1828, a party led by Jedediah Smith insulted and provoked the lower Umpqua tribesmen. The tribesmen retaliated against the unwarranted harsh treatment and 15 of Smith's 19 men were killed. The tribe's Trail of Tears began in 1856. The U.S. military feared that the Coos Indians would get involved in the Rogue River War, so they rounded them up and held them at an encampment near Empire City. Within months, they were marched to the north spit of the Umpqua River, next to the hastily built U.S. Army's Fort Umpqua. The Lower Umpqua and Coos were held there for two and a half years, losing half of the population to starvation, exposure, and disease. In 1859, they were moved further north to live with the al -Si at Yahats on the Great Coast Reservation. Initially, the al -Si, Coos, and Lower Umpqua at Yahats had a very hard time. They were not allowed to travel far enough to supply themselves with adequate provisions, and the crops they were forced to grow so close to the ocean often failed. Many people starved or died from disease. When they got to the uh, Yahats Reservation, it was just a piece of land that uh, they just cleared off or didn't really clear it off, but it was a spot that they thought it was big enough for the tribe, and I think at that time it was like 460 had been placed up there. During the reservation years, there were many Indians who were living on Coos Bay, especially South Slough. At that time, it was illegal for an Indian to be off reservation unless married to a white person. Many of the families living up South Slough hid their kin who had run away from the reservation. In 1856, Congress reduced the Great Coast Reservation, splitting it into two encampments, the southern portion upon which the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayuslaw resided, being the Alsi sub-agency. In 1875, Congress closed the Alsi sub-agency, forcing the Coos and Lower Umpqua out of their homes once again. When the Indian agents attempted to persuade the Coos and Lower Umpqua and Sayusla to relocate to the Siletz Reservation further north, many refused to go. What makes the whites think our people know better than dogs? How can the whites believe in a just God and try and drive the Indians off their land? There are but few of us, and we do not want to go to another country to die. In 1916, the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Saisla worked together to pursue the payment of land claims in order to be compensated for the land that was taken from them. For years, they wrote letters and lobbied Congress. In 1931, they finally got a land claims hearing in court. But the court ruled against the tribe, throwing out oral testimony from tribal leaders detailing village names and locations as hearsay. Despite the setback, the Confederated Tribes did not give up on land claims, working throughout the 1930s and 1940s. Coos Head, land that was first taken from the tribe, land that was always a part of their homeland, was the first land returned through hard-fought negotiations and many emotional and ultimately gratifying meetings with the federal government. Made, I don't know how many trips to Washington, D.C., and we were told that the tribe would never get it back. But the way I went into this process, I figured they beat the ancestors. Uh, they weren't going to beat us at this point in time. It was the first piece of land that the United States government took from the tribe and the first piece of land we got back from the United States government. In 1956, Congress passed a bill terminating all the tribes of Western Oregon, and a new fight was begun to reverse this termination so in 1954 was another area that was real um, tearful for us and the time of termination. And they say, well, you know, we're uh, going to terminate you all and you can just blend in with all the rest of the people. That has never worked. Like telling you that your birthright doesn't exist, that your history doesn't exist, that you have no culture anymore but it always scared me as a child that they were going to take me away from my family. They were taken, some of them were taken to Chamawa, 
Indian school uh, near uh, north of Salem. So they had rules there that was to kill the, kill the Indian and save the man. After a long struggle, the confederated tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Saisla were restored in 1984. Uh, the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Saisla tribe is committed to the uh, making the Oregon coastal region being the very best that it can possibly be. After years of dedicated and persistent negotiations, the tribe finally gained the right to game on the trust land near Florence, Oregon, opening Three Rivers Casino and Hotel in June of 2004. Since restoration, tribal members have been working to improve the social and education status of their people and recapture their history and heritage as well. Not only is this our homeland, but it's where our people live. There isn't any group that is more committed to the economic prosperity uh, of Oregon than Oregon's tribes. There isn't any group that's more committed to the environment of Oregon than Oregon's tribes. And I think that having this tribal perspective, uh, which is multi-generational, really adds to the sequicentennial of Oregon and really adds to the um, thought process of the state of Oregon. Like the other tribes that regained recognition, the Coquel tribe continued to function as a sovereign government after their termination. It was a 35-year struggle, but on June 28, 1989, the Coquel tribe regained federal recognition when President George Bush signed the bill into law. For centuries, the Coquel Indians have lived in the southwest region of Oregon. The estuaries, coastlines, rivers, lakes, and forests have provided an abundance of food that has long sustained the people of the Coquel Indian tribe, including salmon, camas bulbs, deer, elk, lamprey, shellfish, and berries, including the blackberry, salmonberry, cranberry, and the much treasured huckleberry. The Coquels used many materials that surrounded them to live in harmony with the earth. Cedar from the cedar tree was used for clothing, and many types of baskets were woven from such material as the spruce tree. Tools were made from local materials and also traded with other tribes who lived further inland. Life along the coast and inland was good to the people of the Coquel Indian tribe. In the mid-19th century, miners and settlers poured into the land of the Coquel changing their traditional way of life forever. The Coquel tribe is one of several Western Oregon tribes who had their lands unjustly taken from them. In 1855, Indian agents representing the U.S. government negotiated treaties with the Coquel people and other tribes living along the Oregon coast. Unfortunately, the U.S. government did not live up to the promises they made. In 1954, Congress passed the Termination Act, ending federal recognition of the Coquel as a tribe. Well, after we lost our homes, lost our places where we stayed, our villages, and were taken away to the reservation, and the people came back uh, who had escaped, actually, it was a real difficult struggle for them to get by. Some of those people would live off the land and try to live in the old ways but they really couldn't because they only had certain places that they could go. They couldn't, didn't have the freedom to hunt where they used to hunt. And some of them would try to get jobs and work for people, but they were not treated in a nice way. And, and they were hungry and starving, um, but they had big hearts and they kept working at it and they would slowly get jobs they would solely be able to work. And we would begin to learn that learning how to get along in the new, new community was very important. And that we would begin working on educating ourselves and trying to get ahead and trying to see what would be the best way for us to survive. So it was like taking away all of your past 
taking away who you were and you only began from a certain point, which was 1954. Um, it was thought by my relatives whom, as a great loss and like we were, we had disappeared. Um, we were invisible. No one could see us and we couldn't see ourselves. Despite the efforts to disband the tribe, they continued to function as a sovereign government. Following a 35-year struggle to regain recognition, a bill was championed in Congress to restore tribal status to the Coquel people. On June 28, 1989, the Coquel Indian tribe was restored to federal recognition. Since restoration, the Coquel Indian tribe has worked hard to regain their place in the modern world. Coquel Economic Development Corporation contributes to the tribe's well-being through its many business enterprises, which include organic Coquel cranberries, the Mill Casino, Hotel, and RV Park, Orca, a telecommunications company supplying fiber optics to the area, and Heritage Place, an assisted living facility which includes an Alzheimer's unit. The tribe commits many of its resources to helping the Coquel people through housing, health care, education, and natural resource programs which include salmon recovery and management of the Coquel forest. Responsible, environmentally friendly stewardship of the land is a core Coquel tribal value. The Coquel Indian tribe is the second largest employer in Coos County. The tribe's promotion of economic development provides jobs to Coquel tribal members as well as people from the outside community. Our main goal actually is, uh, as I said, education is our number one priority, but health care is right up there with that. And, uh, and by doing economic development, it uh, gives us the resources to help in those areas. And uh, we not only want to help out our tribal members, we also want to benefit uh, the community as well because uh, there's many people in the community that work for us and uh, it gives them the opportunity to raise their families and educate them. When we started out, we had about five employees and now we're up to a thousand. Their commitment to the community is strong. In 2001, the Coquel Tribal Community Fund was established. This competitive grant-making program emphasizes projects in education, health, public safety, arts and culture, historic preservation, and problem gaming treatment. After many meetings and a lot of effort and a lot of support from people in the community uh, who were helping our tribal people do that and helping those folks who worked hard. Um, that support was paramount to the success of our getting restoration and we are very thankful to all the people in the community for their help in getting, helping us to be restored. The Coquel Indian tribe has been here since time immemorial. They survived termination, and this year, the year of Oregon's 150th birthday, is also the Coquel Indian Tribe's 20th Restoration Day celebration in Bandon, Oregon. As they continue to move forward in the 21st century and have significant impact on the Oregon economy, the government of the Coquel Indian Tribe will continue to commit their resources to improving the lives of tribal members and the lives of Oregonians to build a more positive future for all to enjoy. Remember who you are. Remember our ways. Teach those ways to our children. Make sure that our tribal traditions continue. These traditions are very good. They're good for us. They're good for all people. They're good for the earth. Respect everything. Respect yourself and the Mother Earth. Oregon tribes share similar stories. 
we also share a common vision, a vision that looks to the future. This land was not given to us. It belongs to our children, their children, and their grandchildren. We were always taught by our ancestors to look out for the future seven generations. We are building for the future of our people and the future of Oregon. That is really an important aspect of whether you're teaching language, whether you're teaching dance or basketry, is that uh, that pan-generational um, getting together of our families uh, from elders down to young people. That's how we learn, that's how we share our traditions, and that's how we keep them alive. Before it was called Oregon, we lived in this beautiful and bountiful land for tens of thousands of years. Way back when, our ancestors lived on this great land of Western Oregon. The Creator created a supermarket for our people to live. Everything was here. Everything was in place. The seasons come and went. The rains, the sunshine, the warm, the cold provided. The thunder and the lightning provided to take care of what is provided for you, it will take care of you. And even our word in the language for the earth is nanasta, and uh, it means literally uh, made for you. We have survived great challenges and have enjoyed success. We share a heritage of giving and share our bounty with the community. Cow Creek likes to say that we're really not in the business of doing anything except building people. And that commitment is to our outer community as well as our tribal. And we are very thankful to all the people in the community for their help in getting, helping us to be restored. As we go forward with the state of Oregon, that we bring this same sort of long-term vision to the state. And that as we look at our forests, as we look at our coast, as we look at our people, uh, that I think that it really uh, adds to the, um, you know, to, the, to the future of what our state can have. The future is very bright for Select's tribal people, and we look forward to the people that are in schools and colleges today to be our future leaders. Respect everything. Respect yourself and the Mother Earth all up and down the coast and uh, there's drying areas that are left there. And those are visited quite regular even today. People can go back and gather off of the same big rocks on the ocean that our ancestors gathered so many years ago. Uh, they try to put signs along the roads that Indians used to gather here. But Indians still gather here. We are we are here, we're not going anywhere. We're here to stay. We share this beautiful land we all call Oregon.